prepare supper for me. Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are working as slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The Holy Gospel of our Lord. Today, uh, we're starting a series of speakers that will preach throughout the rest of this year and into next year. They're all skilled preachers. They bring new voices to our congregations so that we might have ears to hear them from different perspectives and different backgrounds. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to invite Carl Davis to come up. Carl, uh, just uh, by way of a little background, is a pastor, has been a pastor with uh, three United Methodist parishes. Uh, he has had extensive training in that field, but his current vocation is that of fundraiser. Uh, and he works for the Rotary uh, in, in Carolina, but he lives here as well. And he is also uh, now the chairman of your uh, committee that is tasked with raising funds in a perpetual way for specifically for outreach, for mission for Dodwell House, uh, not for the church. And so uh, he's got quite a task and a wonderful team that he works with, and I'm sure he has some fantastic things to share with us about today's gospel. Carl Davis, if you would join us now, please. the pulpit, but today he's at the AMBO, and I apologize. We'll get that fixed. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, Father Terry, thank you so much for extending this opportunity to me, and thank you, my fellow members of St. Anna's, for being together to worship today and to reflect upon these texts. Father Terry's invitation to preach came to me a little out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. And usually when we open our email these days, it's a lot of uh, bad news and people wanting to uh, get your credit card number for things. So it was nice to open an email and be pleasantly surprised. But then when I looked at what text the lectionary gave us today, I started thinking that there uh, might have been a better Sunday for the invitation. <laughs> But our texts are good texts. All the texts are good, but they teach us different lessons. And one lesson we learned from looking at today's text is that our Bible is a collection of very old stories written by people very long ago from a culture very different than ours. And at the same time that is true, they contain overarching truths that are just as real and vivid for us today as they were for the people and the time and place when they were originally recorded. And I don't think we can really read today's gospel lesson without addressing the fact that slavery is mentioned by our Lord. And I think it's important when we read texts like this to think about them and understand that sometimes when the Bible records something it is being prescriptive, saying we should behave in a certain way or not behave in another way, and other times it's simply being descriptive speaking of something that did exist or does exist in a time and place. And our Lord, in telling this story today about 
faith and having faith the size of a mustard seed use the descriptive method. He took something that was commonplace to him and to his listeners, slavery, and used it to illustrate a point. Sadly, the church historically has misused this text and other texts like it to justify slavery, even in our own denomination, even if you go back and read some of the writings of some of our own diocesan bishops, you would find that those texts have been wrongly used through a racist lens to justify slavery. And such an interpretation of those texts was wrong then and it's wrong now. Our Lord is not saying that any person should be or should ever have been enslaved, but acknowledging a problem and reality of the world in which he lived. And there's a challenge for us too. Sometimes we like to pretend that everything's fine when it's really not. And sometimes we Christians are guilty of doing that for a variety of reasons, one of which is we think it's an article of faith to do that. We think that somehow if God is God and is on the throne and all is right, then there can't really be a problem. And so we have to pretend that problems don't exist in our world because if this problem existed, it would somehow challenge our faith in God. And so sometimes we come up with really creative and illogical excuses or sometimes logical excuses to explain away the suffering we see around us. Well, she had diabetes on account of the way she ate. Well, that person got COVID because they didn't take the shot or wear their mask. That person has AIDS because they didn't wear a condom. This person over there got sick because they chose to ignore the doctor's warning on the packet of cigarettes. This person here has this gigantic student loan debt that they should have to pay back themselves because they chose to major in an unmarketable field. We do that sometimes, don't we? But you know what? It doesn't really make sense. Sometimes when we look around the world and we see things we're just puzzled by them. One of the things I did when I was a pastor was serve as a chaplain at Ground Zero in New York after 9-11, after the uh, tragedies of September 11th, 2001. And one of my jobs there was just to listen to folks who had stories to tell. And I remember the story of a New York police officer. And he said, when the towers came crashing down, the second tower, and, and he and his two fellow police officers realized something was going wrong. They started running towards the towers. And if you've ever been to Manhattan, you'll know that the buildings are quite tall. And by now, we've all seen the visual image. The debris was coming down the street between the buildings like a wall of debris. And as they started running toward it, they realized the wall of debris was coming to them. So they ducked into a little basement-going staircase to try to get out of the debris field. And there was a couple of them. And the fellow who was talking to me was overweight. He smoked. He said he smoked lots of camel cigarettes. And he just was not that great at taking care of his health. And his partner was. She was young. She was energetic. She exercised. She ate right. She did all the right things. And he did all the wrong things. And yet, when that debris field finally passed by, he said it choked him. He couldn't breathe. He said he, he thought he was going to die. He was sure he was dying in that debris field. And finally, when it cleared and he was able to breathe again, his partner had died from the debris field. She was the one who exercised. She was the one who didn't smoke. She was the younger, healthy one. And here he was, the one who everybody in society who would point a finger at and say, that's the reason for the suffering, he lived. And that's what troubled him. And that's what he wanted to talk to me about. Why? How? A part of being a person of faith is to acknowledge that our faith does not give us answers to these questions, but rather, but rather lets us be honest about the question. The prophet Habakkuk today, the prophet Habakkuk today did that. We don't know a whole lot about Habakkuk. It's a funny name, even for a Hebrew name. It's probably translated into Hebrew, some foreign word. 
written sometime between 600 and 800 BC. And it really is the prophet saying, everything is wrong in the world. That's the whole message of the book. Oh Lord, how long will I cry for help and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? The law becomes slack and justice never prevails. I don't know, but I kind of think that Habakkuk could have been writing in New Orleans today, especially when I read this part. I will stand at my watch post. I'll station myself over on Rampart, and I'll keep watch to see what he will say to me. Well, this is a very old text. The truth that it communicates remains relevant to us today. Our faith isn't designed to remove us from suffering or even to explain the suffering that we see. In fact, the opposite of giving us an explanation, it teaches us to know and trust God when we see trouble and when we don't understand. If our faith was designed to simply answer everything, it wouldn't be a faith at all. It would be an explanation. And we haven't got a Christian explanation, we have a Christian faith. If our faith was designed to give us a world view that was holier and better than everyone else's, we'd have a Christian philosophy. Instead, we have a Christian faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we pray the rosary, the tradition is on the first of the Hail Mary beads, we say for an increase in faith, we pray. And the second one, for an increase in hope, we pray. And then on the third, for an increase in love, we pray. And I really like praying for an increase in hope because I love to be hopeful. I love when there's hope on the horizon. I love the idea that we're going to hope for better things to come. And my God, I love to pray for an increase of love. I love to pray for an increase of love in my life because I want to experience more love. I want to love others better. I want to know God's love better. I want to be better at loving. I pray for an increase of love with fervor. But you know that first Hail Mary bead that we raise up to our fingers and we have to say for an increase in faith we pray is sometimes done with great trepidation. Because our gospel lesson today, in addition to being troubling because it addresses slavery, is troubling because of the way Jesus answers the apostles' question of increase our faith. Now, it's a strange question, just kind of out of the blue. The editors of the Revised Common Lectionary like to take us up at verse 5, where they just say, and the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. But if we read a couple verses before that, we see our Lord saying to his followers, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe by anyone by whom they come. He then goes on to say, and if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. And as soon as he says that, that you must forgive over and over and over, the apostles pray, increase our faith. And then it sort of appears that Jesus doesn't actually answer the question, doesn't it? Instead of saying, yes, oh, I'll increase your faith, here's a dose of faith, <laughs> he tells them a story. He tells them a story and he says, if you just had the faith that's as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this tree, move from here to there and it would do it. We can kind of take that, and we, we know that this story of mustard seed faith comes to us a couple different times in the narrative of Jesus on earth, and this is one of those times, and so that's not too shocking for us. But then the next part of it is where he uses that slavery story, and he says, you know, if you have a slave, he's supposed to just do what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to go work in the field, and then he's supposed to prepare the dinner, and that's where our gospel Ends, and the deacon closes the book and walks back to the altar. It can appear that Jesus didn't answer the question at all. But the reality is he does answer the question. Faith is a gift. 
Faith isn't something that we make up. We are not saved because we think the right thoughts. Our faith is not an intellectual exercise of understanding something properly. It's a gift of knowing who God is. And an increase in faith comes from knowing God better. And the way we know God better is to live our life day by day with God. Another day. Doing what we're supposed to do, which is forgive, forgive, forgive. And that's a countercultural message. We live in a world that says don't forgive at all. Louisiana has the worst incarceration rate of any one of the 50 states, and the United States has the worst incarceration rate in any of the developed world. Frankly, we rival communist China in terms of the way we don't forgive, but we incarcerate and punish. And of course, there's economic reasons for that, because it's more profitable to do that than it is to extend forgiveness and reconciliation. But the message of Christ is forgive. And as we forgive in our lives, our faith increases. The prayer, Lord, increase our faith that the apostles prayed, that we pray on the first beat of the rosary, gets answered as we live more, as we pray more. And, 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 and it's funny sometimes. I'll pray for something. I'll pray for something earnestly for years. I'll pray for something five times a day for years and years and years. And then one day that thing will happen. And I am absolutely shocked, flabbergasted, and cannot believe it. Totally dumbstruck that this could have happened. Well, how is my faith? I was praying with the faith I had, but I probably didn't have that much faith, really, because when the prayer happened, I was shocked. But that experience increases my faith. Because the next time I have a problem and I begin to pray like I did, I remember, you know what, the last time this happened, the last time this happened, I was surprised. And my faith isn't, oh, I won't be surprised this time. I don't have that great a faith. My, my faith is more like, well, maybe I'll be surprised again. And so I need to pray that prayer that the apostles prayed. Lord, increase our faith. God's way of increasing our faith is letting us know him better. And that's really what the entire Christian message is about. That's why we say we have a Christian faith. It's this opportunity to know God. And as we know God, we come to get a different perspective. While we join the prophet Habakkuk and others in saying there's a lot of problems in this world, we also come at the end of saying, but we trust God in the midst of them. I don't know why things like 9-11 happen. But I know that while it happened, God was there. I don't know why we have COVID or why we get cancer. I don't know why some of us get diabetes and others don't. I don't know why some of us have much easier lives on this earth than others. But I know that for all of us, God is present with us. That's my experience of faith. And I pray, God, increase my faith. God has given us a faith that we describe together in the creed. At the end of this sermon, we're going to stand and say the Nicene Creed. I like to, not in this church, Father, but in other churches, I've often called it the rebuttal or equal time. But when we stand, we affirm our faith, our understanding of who God is that we've experienced and that generations of other Christians throughout the last 2,000 years have experienced, and that creed is engraved in my heart in Latin, credo in unum deum, patri omnipotentum, factorum celi et terre, visibilium omnium et invisibilium. I believe in one God, the almighty creator of all things, visible and invisible. Our faith allows us to know that God. And you know what? When we realize that God has made himself known to us, we come to understand that he knows us because he is our creator. 
and God knows us because it's our creator. He knows our visible pieces and he knows our invisible pieces. He knows the things that we think no one else knows about us at all, and yet God knows because he is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. And he loves us. He loves us perfectly. He knows us perfectly and he loves us perfectly and it is that singular reality that makes every human being equally worthy of love because God has created each human being and loves each human being by his own sovereign choice, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in God's sovereign choice to create and loves us, he establishes our unchangeable worth by divine decree. And that is true whether he made us black or white or tall or short or any other color or gay or straight or a person who struggles with chronic illness or someone who doesn't. And it's true if we end up in Angola or if we live in a mansion uptown, it doesn't change the reality of the fact that we are known by and created to be known and loved by God. And as we come to understand that through our faith, through our daily living, through meeting God and the problems of living in a world that's as messed up as a place that would have slavery, we know that reality of love better, and we can therefore love our neighbor as ourself, which is the principal call of Christian discipleship. It is the living out of our faith. I'll conclude. That's the favorite word in everyone's sermon. I will conclude with a story. It's an old story. It harkens back to days of train travel in the United States. Maybe it's a future vision looking story too. We might get back to that someday. But the story goes something like this. A young man gets on the train, sits down in the passenger car and he's looking very discouraged. Older man comes, sits down next to him and says, son, you look like something's bothering you. What's, what's, what's the problem? And the young man says to the older one, he says, look, I just got out of prison. He said, I've been a terrible, terrible son to my parents. He said, when I was a young man, I was incorrigible. I gave them grief. They were good to me. I was bad to them. I was just this terrible person. And then I ended up going to county jail. They wasn't from Louisiana. And then I ended up in state prison, and I've just totally destroyed my family's life, and I've just been released from prison, but after living this life, I have absolutely nowhere else to go. So I wrote my parents a letter, and I said, I don't have anywhere else to go, so when they let me out of prison, I'm going to get on the train, and I'm going to head home. But I understand if I'm not welcome there anymore. I understand if I burnt the bridge. And so... If you don't mind, since the train tracks have to pass through our farm property on the way to the station, would you mind, if I'm welcome back home, tying a little white handkerchief to one of the tree branches that hangs by the railroad tracks so that as the train passes by going towards the depot, I can look out the window. And if there is a white handkerchief hanging there on that tree branch, I'll know that it's okay for me to come home, and if I don't see it, I'll just stay on the end of the line and figure out what to do. And the old man said, that's a, that's a very difficult situation. And the young man said, would you help me? He said, we're getting close to the time now where the train will be passing through our property, and I haven't got the nerve to look out the window myself. I'm afraid I'm not going to see a handkerchief. Will you look out the window for me and just tell me if it's there? And so the old man agreed. And as the train rolled along, it came up to the property line, and he looked out, and then he got quiet. And he put his arm on the shoulder of the young man. He said, oh, young man. He said, you are loved indeed, because not only is there a handkerchief tied to the tree, the tree line of the railroad tracks, for as far as I can see, is tied up with big white bed sheets. And standing in the middle is a little old man and woman waving white handkerchiefs as the train goes by. When Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross, that was God's way of putting bed sheets in the trees so that we couldn't meet the message, miss the message that God loves us and knows us. 
He took on human form so that we could relate to him as a human. He lived amongst us in this terrible place and he acknowledged the terribleness of it by saying things like, you have slavery here. He's known to us and we are known to him. And he loves us so much so that he defeated death, the worst thing we can experience, the thing that separates us. He defeated sin, the other terrible thing that separates us. And he replaced them with life and love. And he's with us now. We will know his presence shortly in the Holy Eucharist. And in his presence, we find that we are known and we are loved. And by faith, we can know and love God and others. For an increase of faith, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.